Hello and welcome to the first Mediterranean Seminar podcast. For those of you who do not know, the Mediterranean Seminar is a forum dedicated to the study of Mediterranean societies and cultures and their role in world history and the history of the larger West. Looking at the intersection of three continents, the pre-modern Mediterranean was a shared environment characterized by a tremendous ethnic and religious diversity and by the intensity of cultural, economic, and political exchange. Among Africans, Asians, and Europeans, Christians, Muslims, and Jews, and others, both in conflict and in peace, this dynamic encouraged acculturation and spurred innovations that transformed the societies of the Mediterranean and their continental neighbors. Though because of the dominance of modern national paradigms, the weight of teleological historical traditions and assumptions about the rigidity of ecumenical divisions, the pre-modern Mediterranean is frequently regarded as an anomaly, but was central to historical developments and the cultural transformations that produced modernity. So that is what the Mediterranean Seminar is about. We're a group that has about 1,700 scholarly associates worldwide now, and it is free to join and get on our mailing list and have access to all the things we organize on our webpage. Just go to www mediterraneanseminar.org and you can join for free. So today we're going to be talking about a, a program that we started or an initiative we started a, a little while ago called the article of the month. We thought it would be fun every once in a while to have a, a conversation with the author of the article uh, that was chosen. And so we're going to talk today with Karen Rose Matthews whose article reanimating the power of holy protectors, merchants and their saints in the visual culture of medieval and early modern Venice. And uh, I guess I should introduce myself. My name is Brian Katlas and together with Sharon Kinoshita, we co-direct the Mediterranean Seminar. And now I'll turn it over to Sharon to say a few words about Professor Matthews. Thank you. So Karen Rose Matthews is Associate Professor in the Department of Art and Art History at the University of Miami. She received her BA from UCLA and an MA and PhD from the University of Chicago, all in art history. She's published extensively on the visual culture of the medieval and early modern Mediterranean with an emphasis on intercultural relations and artistic exchange across the sea. In 2018, she published a monograph on the participation of the Italian maritime publics in this multicultural environment, and is currently working on a related book project that explores the role of the Mamluk dynasty in Mediterranean cultural exchange. She's also the editor of A Companion to Medieval Pisa, an interdisciplinary study of Pisan archeology, span history, and art history that will appear next year in 2021. Her research interests also include the use of XR, that is extended reality technologies, in the study and presentation of historic architecture. She has published in this field and has also created an augmented reality application that explores the art and architecture of colonial Latin America. So with that, um, Brian, do you wanna introduce well, Karen again? And Well, why don't we start, uh, Karen, why don't you uh, give us a little, uh, a little short praisey or summary of the, uh, article and uh, we can take it from there. All right, well, this article addresses the cult of saints in medieval and early modern Venice and focuses on the cult of three saints that were significant over a long period of time. So I wanted this to be addressing what I call a long durée or a, an extended understanding of the cult of saints in Venice as it relates to St. Mark, St. Isidore and St. George. So in the article, I argue that these saints were um, uh, recycled, I guess you could say. They were brought to the fore at various times in Venetian history over the course of centuries to serve purposes um, that vary depending upon the constituents to address different audiences. 
and in essence to 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 work their their power to use their miraculous power to serve different groups within the city of Venice. So Mark is the first saint that I addressed. His um, uh, his story is perhaps the most interesting one. He is the saint that is most readily associated with the city of Venice, um, but he wasn't actually the first patron saint. So there is a, a story of usurpation as well when it comes to these holy protectors, as I call them, that uh, they can be replaced quite readily when a new one comes along. And Mark came along as a result of a theft a holy theft or a furta sacra, and everyone loves good theft stories, um, where his body was taken from the city of Alexandria, where it was believed to be under threat by Muslim officials and was brought with great pomp and circumstance to Venice, where he immediately started um, uh, performing miracles for the Venetians, particularly for the Doge. Um, Mark's body was uh, lost, I guess you could say. So, so much for that glorious appearance in the city of Venice. Um, supposedly, he was stuffed in a pillar of the Basilica of San Marco. And then miraculously, once again, um, he was rediscovered at a very important time in the building history of the Basilica when they were really trying to enlarge and aggrandize the space. Um, he once again falls into oblivion to come back again in the service of a very important social group in Venice in the early modern period, and that is a confraternity. And the interesting thing about the confraternities in Venice is that these were groups that were essentially made up of non-nobles. So where Mark had been a saint that worked for the nobility initially, by the time we get to the early modern period, we see that he is performing his miracles for non-nobles, for ordinary citizens, for merchants, and for people who were involved in the Mediterranean trade that was so significant for Venice's lifeblood and Venice's prosperity. So that's just a nutshell of how one saint can have a number of different um, patrons, I guess you could say, and work for a number of different constituencies in one city. Isidore, for his part, was also stolen um, and was an important figure in the ongoing rivalry between Genoa and Venice that went on for centuries as well um, and uh, was particularly related to the island of Chios that was one that was very important for control of the Mediterranean by the Italians. And then George was a saint who once again came from elsewhere, was a saint from the East that was brought to the West to become a patron of Christianity and the Venetians when they were in a particularly difficult period in dealing with the Ottomans. And when Venice was very much challenged by Ottoman dominion of the seas, they brought back um, George as an important protector to show Christianity triumphant over these um, uh, threatening Muslim forces and also was used in a number of paintings by artists like the Bellini to represent their close relationship with other Muslim groups, that is the Mamluks, in juxtaposition to or in opposition to these threatening Ottomans who um, indeed were uh, a troubling presence for the Venetians and did have the potential of threatening their Mediterranean commercial um, hegemony, if you want to use that word, that might be a little bit strong. Um, presence, let's just say presence, um, in the, the 15th and 16th centuries. Great. Well, Karen, um, this work on Venice fits, intersects um, in a way with the book that you recently published, which looks at the four maritime republics of Italy, but in an earlier uh, you know, in a relatively, well, a century and a half, so it's not a short period, um, but you have a kind of um, horizontal take there looking at the four republics, um, juxtaposing them one beside the other because they're distinctive, each one mm -hmm. in its historical context, whereas here you take one of those maritime republics um, and take a longitudinal view, as you said, carrying it through 
through its history. So, you know, already just in those two projects, you show kind of a startling range mm -hmm. in chronology um, and all, but also in um, cultures, because, you know, certainly Venetian art history could be a field all its own. So can you um, maybe talk a little bit about the way that you formulate your projects or um, how Mediterranean may have functioned as a category for you. Um, and just, you know, the, the kind of expansiveness that characterizes your work in general. Right, well, I had, um, had great aims of, in, in the book that I just published, going all the way out to the 14th century. And um, this book would have become an encyclopedia at that point. So kind of had to circumscribe it. Um, and felt that the time period right around the, the First Crusade and um, uh, slightly in its aftermath really created a conceptual unit for all of the four republics. This was a, a time period when these republics were, were, were nascent in a state of becoming, at least two of them were, Pisa and, uh, and Genoa were just coming out into the Mediterranean and the First Crusade played an essential role in defining who they were um, and, and how they wanted to be seen within the, the entirety of the peninsula. On the contrary, Venice and Amalfi had been, or Amalfi slash Salerno, I kind of uh, created a slash um, group there um, for Southern Italy. Um, had uh, been once again Mediterranean presences for centuries, um, several centuries um, before the, the, the Genoese and, and Pisans came in. Um, and just as you say, Sharon, very often these areas of Italy are treated separately. So one could say that fools rush in um, and uh, you know, the Pisans deal, the Pisani deal with Pisa, the Genovese deal with Genoa. And in Italian scholarship, there, there is not a lot of comfort with crossover and maybe even a little bit of competition. Um, so from time to time, you will see volumes that do comparative work and a few volumes that talk about the four maritime republics, but it's not very frequent that you see that happening. So sometimes it, it takes someone from the outside to perhaps reframe a, a, a question or look at material in a different way. Um, and, uh, you know, I've had comments from uh, experts on Genoa and people from Southern Italy. And, you know, so far they've been um, quite complimentary about it. Um, uh, you know, as I said, probably not a way that an Italian scholar would have addressed this, this material. Um, so I had, as I said, quite ambitious aims of talking about all the four republics um, uh, up until the 14th century. And this was just an unwieldy amount of material. So decided to kind of divide it up into to two books, um, but to in, in, in this kind of second book to foreground the, the, the Muslim presence in the Mediterranean, whereas in the, the book on the maritime publics, obviously Italy was in the center. Um, and uh, as you both know, since you've known me since I, I've been working on this material, I've been working on the Mamluks for a very long time. Um, this is a good two decades. Uh, so this is a chance for them to come out into the spotlight. And um, what I find interesting is that they haven't really been conceptualized as Mediterranean powers so much. Um, and that is because they were quite um, navally adverse. How is that for a nice way of putting it? Um, navally challenged, um, not really interested in seafaring um, as the Mamluks were peoples from Central Asia and the Caucasus with perhaps not a long tradition, obviously in their place of origin of that kind of movement. Now, once again, you could say the same about the Ottomans, but they obviously took to the water quite readily. Um, so it's an interesting question unto itself, why the Mamluks did not develop their own Navy. This is a, a question that a number of scholars have dealt with, um, whose work I, I uh, certainly do admire. Um, so what the, the Mamluks did essentially is they just decided that they would have the Venetians or the Genoese, the Italians again, to serve as their um, uh, kind of maritime commerce um, wing. Um, and their uh, naval protection uh, when they so chose. 
um, and uh, didn't necessarily need to have a naval presence. And so I think they've been overlooked for that reason. And so I thought it would be interesting to attempt to, to, to reincorporate them into the Mediterranean um, in the way that the Ottomans have been integrated um, by looking at commonalities in terms of their visual culture that connects them to all of the cultures around the sea. Thanks. So what you said um, about the Maritime Republics and especially about the Mamluks, I think is something that historians could relate to um, quite immediately. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could speak to your experience as an art historian and how your work intersects with, intervenes in, you know, the way that medieval early modern art history um, arranges itself around um, areas, topics, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. Well, in the article, um, I, I crossed a boundary, I guess you could say, that is not often crossed in art history. And that is you work on medieval Venice or you work on early modern Venice. And then you can go on and work on Baroque Venice if you so choose. So uh, art, the art historical discourse still continues to fall the, uh, fo follow these, these kind of strict periodizations. Um, and what was interesting to me is, is someone who was edging into the 14th century already, which was pretty foreign territory for someone who is a Romanesque scholar, you know, so we're talking about the year 1000. Um, and then discovering the extraordinary amount of commonality that existed uh, and continuity as well between the visual culture of early medieval Venice. So we're talking about when the first Basilic of San Marco is created and, and then all the way to the creation of these extraordinary spaces of these confraternities or scuole in the city. And um, so in, in essence, those two are often not brought together, but I saw with the cult of saints, uh, a, a number of threads that you could follow through this material that really created a link between seven centuries or so of Venetian society and Venetian visual culture. So that's something that um, I thought worked particularly well in the context of this material. And I think um, could be of interest for the visual culture of the early modern period that is so rich in a painterly tradition to look back again um, to other visual traditions, um, say the, the significance of Byzantine influence on the, the artworks in the city of Venice itself and to perhaps rehearse some of those um, themes and ideas once again in a longer period of time as opposed to following the strict periodization. Of course, in Italy, it's really tough to know when the Middle Ages ends and when the Renaissance begins and everybody wants their piece of that pie. Um, so maybe we will open a, a debate um, as to where you think that line actually is crossed. Um, as a medievalist, I think that the Middle Ages goes all the way to the 14th century. And I would even take a little bit of the 15th century, but uh, so I'll leave that open and we'll see if um, you know there is great outcry um, from the art historical community. <laughs> we'll see if we can raise a fuss. Wow, only only the 14th or 15th century? <laughs> That's pretty early. It's going out on a limb, Brian. I know it's crazy. <laughs> so, Karen, you're someone that really does art history from a Mediterranean studies perspective. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, today there's, uh, you know, it's not so unusual to hear about uh, uh, scholars, whether they're art historians, uh, historians of literature and culture, or historian historians. Uh, talking about adopting this uh, sort of Mediterranean perspective. But, you know, back in the day when all of us were uh, training as graduate students, mm -hmm. that really wasn't the case. Uh, you know, quite, quite the opposite, I would say. Really, the tendency was for us to be funneled into our little uh, uh, disciplinary and, uh, and national traditions. So I was wondering what the, what the sort of uh, deep genealogy of, mm -hmm. of, your, uh, of your oeuvre is. Uh, what, uh, what, 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 what drew you, what was, uh, you know, what awakened you to the possibilities of, of uh, you know, uh, working in this way and drawing these really 
uh, fascinating and, you know, what are, you know, in, in retrospect, obviously uh, natural uh, comparative, uh, comparative lines. Mm -hmm. Well, I will give an initial shout out to UCLA, um, my undergraduate institution that was an extraordinary place to study. Um, I had very little counseling, shall we say, um, it was kind of an, an, uh, an open place. I was a free range student at UCLA in the 80s. Um, so there I am dating myself. Um, and uh, given that I gravitated to, I studied what I wanted to study. And only when I was a senior was told that I needed to take freshman composition and I needed a science class and, and this kind of thing. So um, I studied history, I studied languages, I studied art history. Um, I loved the, the classes that I took in medieval art history. And then I took classes in Islamic art. And you talk about a place like um, Sicily and somehow you've got a problem there. Um, where does that fit? Um, one or the other or both? And those conundrums were not solved. Um, you know, the, the, the lines were very clearly drawn as to, to what was considered medieval, AKA Western and what was non-Western. But um, I was given an extraordinary education across the board, um, particularly in the classes that I took in art history, so that I was given a broad range of knowledge that I could take with me to, to graduate school. And then once again at the University of Chicago, um, I chose that institution because they promised me um, that I could have an interdisciplinary uh, uh, educational um, experience. And that once again, I didn't need to just be an art historian. So that sold me right off the bat. Whereas in other places where I could have gone, um, I would have been in an art history department that was you know, physically separated from uh, the rest of the rest of the campus and really having to concentrate on that. So um, once again, at the University of Chicago, I took classes at the Oriental Institute, Palestinian archaeology. I studied Ionic Greek. I, you know, I had the opportunity to just cast my net quite large and, and in the end had to kind of come down on, on a, a more specific dissertation topic. But for my master's thesis, for example, I wrote about um, uh, descriptions of three extraordinary monuments in the city of Jerusalem, the, the Dome of the Rock, um, the, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the Temple of Solomon and um, sort of responses to these buildings. And so I was able to, to bring in uh, I guess a Mediterranean perspective already um, uh, in, in, in that um, piece of written work. Um, so for my dissertation, I did a Western medieval Spanish topic, but when you're in Spain, you know that you always have the opportunity um, to uh, kind of uh, break down barriers and move between boundaries. And so Spain was my opportunity to, to just kind of open up and maybe do a, a, a more traditional Western medieval topic, but to have the material under my belt that I could take off when, um, when that was over. So indeed, akin to your experiences, there was no Mediterranean studies. It, it didn't exist. Um, and I'm sure that this was the case with you as well, that you just cobbled it together. It's what interested you, you were able to do it. Um, and I thankfully was given the freedom, the, the kind of intellectual freedom to, to study these things. Um, uh, not with any real, I don't I, I'd like to say that I had a plan, but I had no plan. Uh, but uh, with this idea that this is all interesting stuff and then, you know, after um, uh, I finished my thesis and went on to, to, to work in the field, um, then I was able to start kind of putting things together and, and really working in a, in a more Mediterranean fashion. So um, I was given good building blocks and good tools and I'm extraordinarily thankful to those educational institutions that um, they kind of let me do what whatever I wanted, just as long as I went to class. Yeah, I think there's something to be said for uh, uh, institutions that are, are so big and have such a, 
a variety of offerings. I mean, this is what the university is supposed to be, right? This sort of idea of universal knowledge. Your experience was really similar to mine as I went to the University of Toronto mm -hmm. uh, as an undergraduate and as a graduate student. And as an undergraduate, my policy was I would not take any classes before 11 a.m. and none after 2 p.m. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I ended up with this sort of crazy grab bag of classes too. But out of that came, you know, a really sort of interesting uh, perspective on things. So it's it's a shame that now, uh, you know, we're in a we're in a time that so many universities are are, are cutting back, uh, and making administrative decisions about cutting programs that may not seem as as relevant or as lucrative, and which uh, may end up seriously uh, gutting, uh, you know, the sort of uh, intellectual uh, quality of of, uh, of their institutions, and which, you know, sort of prevent the the kind of innovative stuff that that you're doing from from coming up, sort of, uh, you know, from developing organically and and naturally just through being exposed to so much. Yeah, I would tend to agree, and yet on the other hand, one could say that in its stead, perhaps there is a, a the, the promise of a curriculum that is actually Mediterranean in nature, right? That now that this has become so commonplace um, that you two have been involved in creating an institution, I guess you could say, right? It's been institutionalized that, that more pick and choose um, kind of approach and maybe replaced by something that's a little bit more systematic and, and who knows what that might engender. Um, so um, I'm, I'm always trying to, you know, think of the glass half full, but I, I share your concern about um, things that might be considered obscure, like Ionic Greek, um, that um, were absolutely just mind blowing from my perspective and, uh, you know, uh, uh, extraordinarily formative in terms of um, you know who I am and and what I know and 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 how I think um, but uh, we we have a we have now a Mediterranean industry um, uh, you know a book series and conferences and I said you all have been in, uh, highly involved in, in creating this um, and that must be so heartening for younger scholars coming up to see this to have it valued, to know that they don't have to choose and that they, they, they can do all of these things um, and uh, can, can cast their net widely when it comes to their intellectual choices and, and have a, a, a substructure for them, a foundation upon which they can build. Well, as someone outside the field of art history, I'm just you know, fascinated by the materials that you work with. And so I wanted to kind of bring out the uh, real material and granular quality mm -hmm. of the objects through which you make your, your arguments and interpretations. Um, so one dividing line, which is maybe not as hard and fast as some of the others we've discussed, but let's say the distinction between um, architectural historians on the one hand, mm -hmm. and then people for the medieval world working with movable objects, mm -hmm. um, which are so important in the Mediterranean. So um, as you said, with your master's thesis, you sounds like you really started out on the monumental architecture mm -hmm. side. Um, but since you have worked with a lot of um, smaller objects, I wonder if you could I, I would just like to hear you riff on what the differences are, or or is that a misconception to think of differences, or how how working both sides of that um, line, I won't call it a division, um, mm -hmm. has um, benefited your ability to read objects on both sides. Mm -hmm. I think I think what connects them. I, um, uh, is on the one hand, those small scale portable objects can actually be ornamenting um, larger architectural structures. So um, you can have your cake and eat it too, um, which is fabulous. Um, and um, on the other hand, I think what joins them is an aesthetic. And this is the, the kind of prime motivating factor, I think, for the work that I do is trying to understand an aesthetic that had been quite problematic um, from an art historical perspective. 
I have actually had art historians say to me, um, why is it that you work on such ugly stuff? Um, and so it felt almost like a mission to, um, to explain um, uh, and, and um, create a, a, a kind of methodological approach to address these objects that have been discarded to some degree because they're problematic, they're messy, they're ugly. Um, uh, you know, what a, what a horrible um, value judgment, but, and, and, and so anachronistic um, because these objects were not ugly um, from the perspective of people in the, the medieval and early modern period. They were the height of beauty. Um, and I think the objects that really got me to that point and really started me in on this, this interest in spolia and these kind of reused objects being put in incongruous new settings is a, a set of um, liturgical objects from the Etonian period. So German liturgical objects and um, they are encrusted and chunky and shiny and, and um, they are not smooth and beautiful and, 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 and peaceful and calm um, and I just zeroed in on these objects. There's a, a beautiful cross that has a bright blue lapis lazuli head of the Empress Livia um, as the head of Christ. Um, and it is just the strangest thing you've ever seen, this bright blue head and this golden cross, incongruous, strange, weird. Um, and I wanted, I wanted to understand that aesthetic and then I wanted to present it as something that was, was legitimate, that this wasn't just a, a, a throwaway, this wasn't just something that someone slapped together um, and said, oh, that's terrible, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to use that again. Um, these things were honored, privileged, placed in areas of great prominence and architectural structures. So I think that's what really drove me is to start thinking about what motivated people to create artworks that looked like that. Um, so these are themes that once again, we all have um, spoken about um, and uh, ones that I just will not let go. Um, eclecticism, hybridity, um, variety, incongruity um, are all significant components of a medieval aesthetic that I think is quite widespread something that animates artistic production across Western Europe, something that was absolutely central to the artworks of the maritime republics. And then once again, to, to get back to this discussion of the Mamluks, one that informs the art of the Mamluk dynasty, art that once again, from the perspective of Islamic art is considered to be rather ugly. Um, and so uh, compared to say Persian art, which is considered to be the, the high point, the, the, the apogee of, of beauty. And Mamluk art does not look like Persian art. Um, it does take some characteristics of it. So how do we recuperate um, this, uh, an entire dynasty of, of uh, you know, several hundred years of artistic production, um, places and periods um, that uh, once again have kind of been relegate, relegated to uh, uh, a side frame. Um, I see you've got there a picture of an oliphant. Um, how do you recuperate objects um, for which we cannot assign any provenance? And uh, we have no idea where they made, where they made, where they came from who used them, how they were used. And once again, just thousands and thousands of objects and artworks um, have been um, pushed to the side or, you know, as I said, um, ignored because they, they're, they're, they're problematic for a number of, of different reasons. And um, I tend to gravitate towards those, um, those objects and try to find uh, assess some kind of meaning um, because these objects were made by the thousands. They were um, preserved um, carefully for uh, centuries, if not a millennia, um, a millennium. And um, so they were certainly more than, than, than throwaways, um, than, than, than things that were um, one-off experiments. Um, so that's a, uh, that, that, that's what unites um, the architectural aesthetic that uses a lot of these objects to decorate them. And you have 
those strange juxtaposition of things on buildings like the Basilica of San Marco, um, the, the, the ceramic, uh, Islamic ceramic bowls that I talk about on, on the exterior of churches. Um, once again, a, a kind of a strange mixture of cultures and things, um, but in the end made sense to the people who used them and, and had deep significance, or they wouldn't have gone through all that trouble. I just have to say that one of my all-time favorite article titles is your study of the Bacini in Pisa, mm -hmm. Other People's Dishes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, I, I, it was really, they were really perceived and appreciated because they were other people's dishes. Um, and the, the wondrous thing about those plates is that there is evidence that they were actually used as plates first and then put on church facades. And how extraordinary I hope they them. is that? Um, you know, I'm done with this fork. Uh, you know, let me, uh, let me use it to ornament, you know, my parish church. Um, it, uh, it, is, it is quite weird. Um, so, you know, it, it raises the, the strangeness of, of that from our perspective, but the highly quotidian nature of that reuse. Um, and once you start looking for Bacini, and um, I have now become part of a, a very large international community of scholars working on this topic. Um, in, in Crete, on the island of Crete alone, there are over 300 buildings that use um, ceramics as uh, ceramic bowls um, as decoration. So once you start scratching the surface, it, it's just extraordinary, the amount of material that's there. And um, so satisfying and fulfilling to talk with people who share that, that interest um, and are interested in kind of, you know, sharing their knowledge um, and their wonder at, uh, at this, uh, this artistic phenomenon. I, w I want to underscore what you just said about, um, you know, I mean, Pisa is known for its Bacini, but you're mm -hmm. saying that all of these examples have been discovered um, on Crete, and once you scratch the surface, mm -hmm. this could be, you know, the the motto of Mediterranean studies. I think, you know, because mm -hmm. we have people coming up with things that seem irregular in their own little corner of the Mediterranean, and then it turns out that oh, it's happening over here and over mm -hmm. there as well. So, and, and you want to talk about a pan Mediterranean phenomenon? Um, they are everywhere. You can indeed trace the entirety of the Mediterranean from west to east and find this example of um, an artistic practice and an aesthetic that appreciates that artistic practice around the entirety of the, the Mediterranean. So let's hear it for bowls. Yeah, and you know, this is something I think that we find again and again with uh, uh, Mediterranean culture. Uh, it often functions at this, at this level uh, uh, at least in one manifestation at this sort of uh, level which flies beneath the radar of formal written sources. Mm -hmm. And so because we've, you know, uh, you know, traditionally we've, we've privileged these, these written sources, the, one that's, the ones that survive, the ones that are produced by, you know, certain elites for certain specific purposes, and they don't mention or acknowledge these things, or perhaps they even deliberately ignore them because they're uncomfortable or they they seem to contradict their agendas and so really a, a great deal of what what we end up doing I think in Mediterranean studies is scratching that surface and bringing these things to light and and realizing that there was this potent coherence to the region which is just doesn't register in the in the sources and the approaches that we for no necessarily particularly good reason have privileged to the exclusion of other perspectives. And that's, I think, really important and really exciting. But let, let me ask, and we're, we're running out of time, unfortunately, but let me ask just a, a, another uh, little question. It's kind of building on the last one. So uh, you've sort of answered this uh, already a little bit, but I, I wanted to ask you that, you know, given the work that you've done, uh, where would you like to see, in what directions would you like to see your, your field heading uh, in the future? And, uh, you know, for those uh, graduate students who may be listening and are, are scratching their heads about what a good dissertation or, or field of study uh, might be, what, what's, what, what are going to be the, the next hot spots in, uh, 
in Mediterranean. Uh, art <laughs> history. Hotspots in the Mediterranean world. You know, I was thinking. I was thinking about where Mediterranean studies would go. I mean, on the one hand, I think that that this this eclectic and broad field has now achieved um, legitimacy in academe, and uh, you know, it's there and it's not going away. So. Amen for that, that's fabulous. And then where do you go from there? Um, is, that, is that all there is? Is that it? You know, you, you become part of the establishment. Um, and I, I'm, I'm wondering what could, what could be the say revolutionary potential for this? Um, where could you go beyond that? How will it, it subdivide further um, instead of going back to, because it's gonna get too big at a certain point, right? Instead of going back to, our period divisions and our cultural divisions and our linguistic divisions. Um, maybe Mediterranean studies becomes defined more by methodology and uh, your approach, um, your model is one that um, starts creating kind of offshoots. Um, uh, the engagement with technologies perhaps might define uh, a different aspect of Mediterranean studies that could be extraordinarily fruitful. And talk about scratching the surface when given new tools um, uh, for investigation, just think of what people might be able to find above and, and below ground. So um, I, I don't know what the next new thing is. Um, I'm gonna wait and see. I'd love to. I'd love to prognosticate, but that is beyond my. Uh, that is beyond my skill set. Um, but rest assured that there remains myriad artifacts, um, objects, and places that have not received their due. Um, and I will leave it to a younger generation to go out and find them. <laughs> there you go. It's a, a charge for the the, uh, the newer scholars that are listening to go forward. Yeah, the, tech, the technological thing is really interesting in so many different ways. I mean, the, the mere fact that now, uh, you know, we can easily digitally access uh, obscure journals from around the world uh, or doctoral dissertations that are done mm -hmm. in different countries by mm -hmm really amazing graduate students. Uh, and these studies may never come out, probably will never come out as monographs. Mm -hmm. That in itself, I think is uh, a really interesting, transformative and democratizing, democratizing process mm -hmm. in scholarship, because all of a sudden, uh, you know, the sort of the whole process of publication, which on the one hand acts as a gatekeeper, but on the other hand, is also a, an, an obstacle is mm -hmm. being lifted quite a bit. I think mm -hmm. particular, particularly uh, in terms of including uh, the perspectives of scholars from other places in the world. And I think that's, uh, that's really exciting, not to mention mm -hmm. other types of technology like the uh, you know, enhanced reality stuff, mm -hmm. uh, right, um, right. virtual reality, et cetera. That's part of it too. But I think just the mere fact that we can talk to each other and share our scholarship so much easier is uh, you know, I think it's an amazing thing. Yeah, and big data is not a term that is often used to describe medieval studies or maybe Mediterranean studies in general, but there's a huge potential for big data that is with this democratization of content and knowledge, one has access to huge, huge data sets. And then how do you, um, how do you manage that? How do you process that? And how does that change the, the type of inquiry you undertake? It, it completely changes the kind of questions you act, ask about material when you're not working on one building, but you're working on 5 million pieces of data, whatever it may be, if you're um, mining a text or a um, or hundred texts, whatever it may be. So, you know, that, that, that will be very interesting as well. You know, I think um, these fields will change in ways that we cannot even envision, envision and we'll just have to sit back and watch it play out. Buckle our seat belts. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be a wild ride. <laughs> Sharon, any final comments or questions before we well, wrap up? It was a pleasure to be part of this inaugural article of the month <laughs> podcast and long may it rain.
<laughs> well, thank you. You've been a, a great uh, guest. Thanks for the great uh, conversation and agreeing to be our, our guinea pig. So uh, a link to uh, your article is up on our webpage. If anyone wants to read it, you can go to uh, www.mediterraneanseminar.org, click on projects and article of the month, and you'll find all of our articles of the month archived there. So with that, Sharon, any, any final comments uh, to make before we sign off? Only to thank Karen because she's been a fellow traveler practically from the beginning of our project. So it's wonderful to have our initial podcast be with you. It's been a fun ride and okay. always a pleasure. Okay, well, thank you very much. All right, have a good evening.